the classic Chapo reading series because it's Jonathan Chait. I haven't said that name in a long time. He fell off. He he really did fall off. But he's back now. Uh, I'm just going to read the the, the headline is the left wing authoritarians shutting down the Democratic Party. (laughs) Once again, (laughs) once again, I've I've been sold this. I've, I've been lied to so many times. So many times I've been just given this tantalizing glimpse of an authoritarian ruler banning the Democratic Party and jailing its leaders. We'll see. We'll see if Jonathan Chait gets us there. But I, I'm not holding my breath. But this is basically part and parcel of a lot of the kind of bargaining phase of liberal Zionism right now, which is basically like, I know what Israel, I know uh, Israel uh, destroying every school and university in Gaza seems bad. But think about what's happening on universities in this country. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of miss Jake. You do got to hand it to him. He knows exactly how to be the most annoying of that specific type of like yeah. bald guy who writes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, yeah, compared to like the people who have sort of replaced him in our, our uh, cultural uh, cultural consumption. Compared to like Richard Hanna had uh, Richard had, Hanna Barbera uh, Han, Hanna <laughs> Hanaria whatever <laughs> like those guys are all like freaks they're all the yeah. weirdest people who ever fucking lived literally if they lived in any time before a Substack they would be forced to live in a cave by their village or town uh, but Chate is like he's a normal annoying guy. You know, yeah, he's a very recognizable character in, in people's lives. He's the guy at your office who, you know, takes a sort of like an annoying, unhealthy interest in a 23 year old who works there. And it's not like a me too thing. He's just really annoying. He's just always cornering this poor girl and being like, I've noticed you eat a lot of bowl meal. <laughs> it's like, you're right. Like, cause he has, cause you know, he comes from like a certain professional pedigree so he can always get away with the sort of ain't i a stinker sort of attitude without <laughs> doing what richard ahonaria does which is uh, uh providing what he describes as moral clarity on israel palestine by quoting sam harris saying hamas is worse than the nazis <laughs> because the nazis yeah. didn't try to kill women and children yeah what are we doing here really i mean like because i mean like that's how bad it's gotten for supporters of israel is that they have to say that hamas is officially more evil than the nazis yeah <laughs> it's a it's i mean it's not only that you know in my mind like ultimately those two guys their position in israel is like the same at the end yeah. of the day right but with with richard hanania and like guys like that the thing that like uh I don't like about them is that it's just like it's like the normal conservative stuff, right? Like that that's like 70% of their writing, you know, like affirmative action and Israel Palestine. But then like 30% is just like the grossest thing you've ever read. It's yeah. just like you, I tried anal sex once and the girl ended up in a coma. <laughs> What's wrong? What's wrong? And it's, and it's like, ew. Ew. Why, 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 why do you have an entire... And here's why no one else should attempt what I did. Yeah, yeah, it's like, ew. Why do you have an yeah. entire, like, sub-blog about, like, hand job injury? Yeah. Like, what's what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and like at least Jonathan Chait isn't like gross like that. Yeah, what why I converted from Seventh Day Adventism to Eastern Orthodoxy because one time a girl put her finger in my butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but other guys, you know, like the like the Matt Iglesiases of the world are just like that's just a guy who somehow you end up like across a table at like a dinner party listening to him talk to you about something that happened to him when he was an undergraduate and you just can't, there's just no way to get him to stop talking about some class that he took. But like jo- John Chait is just, he's like a uh, Cadorance. He's like mad that his schnipper's order is late <laughs> all the time. It's like, that's his, the, like with this article that he wrote about, about, Oh, how terrible it is that people stand up and yell at <laughs> yeah. Democrats at campaign rallies. It's just like, I, I'm, this is just such an inconvenience convenience to me it's just like such a fussy way of looking at the world i mean oh you were so eager to hear uh what kamala harris's chief of staff had to say <laughs> about, about the EV tax incentive like yeah. act like it's somebody who like 
ran up on stage during the encore at like the at at the last fucking Taylor Swift concert or whatever. Like, give me a break. Were you really that concerned with what you were about to hear? Yeah, it's very well. I I, I well, I just Jacob. I got to read the first paragraph of this because it's so funny. Pay attention, kiddos. This is how a pro works. Imagine a world. Ima- um, this is like a movie trail. <laughs> Imagine a world. In a world that's powered by violence. On the streets where the violent have power. In which Congressman Jamie Raskin attempts to deliver a speech on democracy, autocracy, and the threat to reason in the 21st century and is unable to deliver his remarks because Trump supporters drown him out and authorities justify the disruption as an exercise in democracy. These are the kind of scenes that come to mind when we imagine the authoritarian culture of a Trump second term. They are also oh. events that have not only occurred, but have grown commonplace. This pattern of behavior is illiberal and dangerous. But I just love he says, imagine a world in which Congressman Jamie Raskin can't deliver <laughs> some boring fucking speech because people yell at him. Uh, uh, I'm, fi- yeah, I'm imagining it right now. It sounds great, John. What are you talking about? Jamie Raskin can't talk about unreason in the 21st century? Hold up. Gen Z is trying to cancel Jamie Raskin. (laughs) (laughs) Not him. Hell no. (laughs) Not that guy. Not that standard bearer of the Democratic Party who people who don't spend um, 48 hours in every 28 hour, 24 hour period staring at a computer screen. Like <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel like if he, if you watch a Jamie Raskin speech and you don't like work for him or lobby for him, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be in prison, but you should definitely be on like a list that everyone can see. That's it's just insane behavior. Like yeah, what the it, fuck is wrong with you? It's like for people who it's like for the, like for your weird liberal relatives who like, who will, take you aside at a family function and just like make you look at clips, video clips on Aaron Rupar's <laughs> <laughs> Twitter stream. Like, uh, AOC destroys Republican congressional witness. And it's like, okay, I understand this is the content that you like. And I understand that there are people in the world who just want to see people's skincare routines. And there are people in the world who just want to see like smash videos, but like, it's just it it doesn't have the cultural currency that people like John Jay think it does. Yeah, because you yeah, that that is like watching a Jamie Raskin speech is like those guys who are so into football they, that they follow like high school teams and states they don't live in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you are yeah, threatening you are a high schooler way. because they didn't cover the spread. Uh, yeah. In a softball game. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you catch a relative watching a Jamie Raskin speech, <laughs> you need to send him to article rehab. <laughs> <laughs> no articles for like a few years at least. Yeah, oh, I, mean, I skipped the best part though. He says, uh, yeah, uh, uh, because Trump's orders drown him out and authorities justify the disruption as an exercise in democracy. Democrats attempting to raise money for the opposition are surrounded on the street by Trumpists shouting, fuck Joe Biden and abusing them with racial epithets. The twist oh, yeah. for us. What are, <laughs> what, what, what are the racial epithets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, man. Cracker, honky. Yeah. <laughs> Presbyterian. it says here the twist of course is that the mob shutting down the opposition to trump are not trump supporters or at least not right-wing trump supporters pro-palestinian activists have set out to disrupt democratic party officials from speaking and raising funds to defeat trump a new york times story recently drew some attention to the political problem this creates for democrats indeed some of the protesters are trying to defeat biden ergo to elect trump to teach the Democrats a lesson. And others are merely trying to force the Democrats to move left before the election. Isn't this just called like being in a democracy? Like these are campaign events. And like you said, fundraisers, like should that be shielded from political criticism? Like you should just be able to like give campaign speeches and raise money unfettered when you're doing a war that people are opposed to. But apparently you can't yell at their houses either. The way that he like characterizes fundraisers is so precious where it's like, this is money to defeat Trump. <laughs> this isn't at all. This isn't at all like a Byzantine Rube Goldberg device to pay Robbie Mook like way too much money. This is like this is specifically the anti-fascism fund. It's also like it's a moral universe in which like it's totalitarian and intolerable and illiberal to um, heckle someone when they're giving a speech. 
Um, but it's, I don't know, it's like justifiable to bomb a hospital because there's like an underground parking facility nearby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just so crazy to me. That's what, that's what people should start saying. They should start what? saying, well, I only disrupted the speech because I suspected that there might be a tunnel beneath the venue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. And when he says here, uh, they're trying to, uh, to teach the Democrats a lesson or really trying to force them to move left before the election. It's just like, isn't that called petitioning the party that's trying to earn your vote? <laughs> like, I don't, what, what, yeah. what are the other options here, John? Please enlighten me. And isn't this the thing that like you were supposed, like if you were like, if you were like, listen, I am to the left of everyone. I support fucking Liz Warren. But if you don't vote for Biden, you should kill yourself. And like, well, the reason we're voting for Biden is we're going to push him to the left. We're going to do this. Well, now everyone's d- doing that. They're, they're doing that. It's just like on an issue that you think is sacrosanct. But the only way you're allowed to do it is by writing articles and posting. And, yeah. it, and, and and the posting should be messy. Yeah, it should be civil. But uh, also, like, as long as he's indulging in sort of, like, uh, make-believe scenarios, like, imagine a world in which Jamie Raskin can't finish a speech he's giving at a fundraiser, and people to chase him into the parking lot and yell, fuck Joe Biden at him, and also hurl racial epithets at Jamie Raskin. I mean, okay, let's imagine someone doing that to Donald Trump and his supporters. Imagine Donald Trump getting booed out of like, you know, uh, booed out of giving a speech and chased into a parking lot with people calling him fatso and bald. <laughs> would, you, would you have a problem with that? No, I think that'd be funny. It would be Especially funny. if they were yelling racial epithets at Donald Trump. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Certainly not a threat to democracy. I mean, like... <laughs> So it says here, but the problem is not mere, uh, one of mere efficacy. Drowning out speakers and disrupting exercises in politics, regardless of its cause or the target, is wrong on principle. I- I'm not referring to tactics like holding protest marches, speeches, social media posts, organizing uncommitted votes in the Democratic primary, or other exercises of First Amendment rights. I'm specifically referring to a campaign, uh, referring to a campaign to shut down speakers who oppose or in even many cases simply decline to endorse the movement's agenda. Usually it means interrupting speeches with screaming insults until the protesters are dragged out of the room, which has become the norm at Biden campaign events. At events with sub-presidential levels of security, protesters often succeed in overwhelming the event and its security and shutting down the speech or event entirely, sometimes employing violence. I'd place in the same category aggressive personal harassment campaigns, like gathering outside someone's home at three o'clock in the morning with bullhorns shouting, we will not let you sleep or surrounding individuals on the street to scream insults. Oh, so he disagrees with the United States treatment of Manuel Noriega. <laughs> <laughs> He's not, not a fan of Van Halen. <laughs> no, but it's just like, hey, Jacob, like you said, like the context of this is just like, some of the worst atrocities that like we've ever had the displeasure of witnessing. And he's talking about like, sometimes the speakers even yell at people so loudly they have to leave. And it's just like, Oh, yeah. well, to, to go home to their house where they sleep safely and comfortably and have food to eat. Like uh, what? I yeah. guess like, how is anyone still writing this article? Like the, the, this article, this article was like overdone in 2013. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I think Jonathan Chait has written this article 20 times. Why did why, like did the world need this again? This is why he fell off. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like this article is like his version of like the green juice that Steve Jobs used to drink, which is just like <laughs> if I do it one more time, it will cure me of this of this malady that's been eating away my body and soul for all of this time. But it's just not. It's just not working. He, he, but he has faith in it. I, I sort of like that. Like, I think, I think he does actually believe that if he keeps saying this in public in effectively the same way over and over again, that it's going to work. I mean, as if people in, in the Democratic coalition haven't been interrupting campaign events and uh, national conventions going back. There was a fucking riot in Chicago. 60s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was like <laughs> one of the incredibly violent riot in Chicago during the 68 Democratic. <laughs> and why? Because there was a fucking war that was killing millions of people. Yeah, why but, can't these guys at my why can't these guys at my favorite sporting event just sit politely in their seats and stop yelling so much? I'm trying to watch the game. <laughs> It says here, the goal of these maneuvers is not to make the case for pro-Palestinian policy, but to abuse and deny basic rights to those who fail to endorse the protesters' beliefs. I mean, once again, it's just like, 
okay yeah like, like let, let's take that let's take that you know like uh, let's agree with that um you know for the sake of argument i mean what is there left to do but abuse and deny the basic rights to people who don't share these pro protesters specific belief on this because it surely isn't just saying like hey i'd like um, the people i vote for to uh, behave differently because they're not and they never will is it a basic right to like be a zionist and then like the next day you get to make a speech about I don't know, uh, mindfulness, and democracy, or whatever the fuck the Jamie Raskin speech was was about. That's not a human right. Is, <laughs> no, he, is, it, he, <laughs> is he talking about like the audience has a human right to hear Jamie Raskin speak? <laughs> well, he says, and yes, being prevented from holding a planned speech to supporters stalked on the street or subjected to sleep denial are all forms of abuse. <laughs> sleep denial, <laughs> like, like it's fucking like, like, Abu like Jamie, Grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like they're, they're, they hang him from handcuffs from the <laughs> ceiling and blast music at him twenty four seven. No, there's just someone banging pots and pans going like, no war, no war. Put some <laughs> fucking earplugs in, for Christ's sake. You're fine. These people deserve a lot worse. He, he wakes up at, he wakes up at like fucking home on square. The uh, Chicago police pull the black hood off of him. He's shackled <laughs> to a chair. And they're, like, and they're like, we're here to talk to you a little bit about the Palestinian experience. And no, <laughs> you can't call a lawyer. <laughs> It says here, uh, uh, almost nobody believes that these are all just natural parts of the give and take of public disagreement. The most elemental premise of liberalism is that politics should be governed by a uniform set of rules or norms that apply to everybody, regardless of the content of their beliefs. Oh, really? Does it apply to people living in Gaza right now? It certainly <laughs> seems like it doesn't. This is the, the, they're excluded from the uh, the universality and uh, elemental uh, uh, nature of liberalism. Yeah, the thing is, he doesn't even believe that. Uh, like, he, he, no, they, of course these not. These people don't even believe that in the domestic sphere. Like, does John Chait imagine that like the ideal liberal future of America is like uh, Ian Banks' luxury space communism, where the robots run everything and everybody has an equal right to have articles and. New York magazine. Like, no, of course not. Because in that type of like end state, everybody gets to speak and everybody's voice gets heard environment, then there are no John Chates and there are no Jamie Raskins. So it's like the, the idea is actually no, that like a certain number of people have been selected through a, a process of like professionalism and advancement to have a right to give a speech about whether or not Vladimir Putin makes me feel sad in the morning and everybody else is supposed to just hear it passively. And likewise, like that, well, that like the only mechanism through which one um, engages in politics, if one is not Jamie Raskin is just by voting, but you're also not allowed to withhold your vote. Because that's also a liberal. That's intimidation. And, and and a form of intimidation. It's it's a and, it's a form of voter intimidation. When I say I'm not going to vote for X X or Y candidate, you're intimidating the people who do plan to vote for them. You're like the guy when everybody goes out to dinner and the waiter comes over and says, "Who'd like to look at the dessert menu?" And you're the guy who ruins it for everyone by saying, ah, "I'm not really no. interested in dessert." And then, <laughs> and then everybody else feels like they're bad and they order dessert, so nobody gets dessert. Everyone feels like a fat guy with a cane <laughs> sitting at that table. <laughs> but okay, here, here's a great paragraph. He says, "Abusive protesters usually meet critiques of their illiberal methods with a facile comparison to the civil rights movement, but that movement was designed for a political environment in which basic liberal rights did not exist. Black Americans lack the right to vote." to petition for grievances or otherwise exert basic freedoms that white Americans enjoyed. Can you see, can, can you, can anyone identify for me the what like the, why this speaking about this particular thing that people are protesting uh, is, in, is in fact is comparable to the civil rights movement. Once they gave Bass Reeves that job, racism was over <laughs> and that, and that ended the need for people to be disruptive to political speeches. So uh, I simply don't see why they should be allowed to do it now when certainly black people are treated in this country in a way that is definitely equal and fair to everyone else, if not more equal and fair to everyone else. I can't think of a single incident or historical event within the last five, six years, including uh, ones that Jonathan Chait has written about that might give you the impression that 
there are any persistent civil rights inequities or uh, inequities in access to voting in the United States of America. Can't can't name a single incident. Well, yeah, and if you want to uh, extend that to uh, Palestine and the occupied <laughs> territories, uh, let's just go to yeah, right. Says so, uh, Black Americans lack the right to vote, to petition for grievances, or otherwise exert basic freedoms that White Americans enjoyed. It's just like the condition of people in Gaza right now; they have significantly fewer rights than that, and yeah. that's why people are mad at Jamie Raskin. They, they couldn't vote. They couldn't vote even before the Israelis started bombing the fucking place. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> Like, couldn't get passports. You couldn't leave the territory without permission. Sometimes, if you left the ter- without territory without permission, you'd still get arrested. People were being killed. People's homes were being expropriated in the West Bank. I mean, it's like, and and, and he, but he he. I remember in the article, he tries to immunize himself from this argument because he says he he draws this distinction where he's like, everybody now is a victim, and victims have special privileges. But then the people who claim to be representing the victims claim to have the privileges that the victims get, which is a, an absolutely like wild thing to say. Well, yeah, the, the, pri- the privilege to have your family killed. Like, is, yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, he's saying, right. He's saying that there's a, there's a privilege in having your family killed. And then by the transitive property of privilege and victimhood, people who are standing up in speeches and, and, and yelling, and making political statements are are claiming by proxy a victimhood which they don't deserve. Yeah, I mean, once again, it's just like any any bargaining to get away from like the essential fact of what's going on here. It's like you know, it's like who has the right to protest on behalf of Palestinians in this country? I mean, what what what, what about like if you're a Palestinian who has a relative in the West Bank or Gaza right now? Are, can you does that transit of property extend to you if they've been killed or are facing death right now? The the thing that's so odd about it too is that it's like it's it it's solely based on this sort of annoyance that like this might make some, make things like marginally more difficult for the Democrats to get uh, for Joe Biden to get reelected and it's like yeah but I mean as people uh, lots of people on the left and lots of pro Palestinian voices have been saying like I mean Joe Biden wouldn't he doesn't have to even come out come out and say like I. Uh, recognize a, a single multi-ethnic state from the river to the sea. He doesn't have to come out and say, I recognize Palestine in the 1967 borders. He can say, like, uh, we're going to suspend new arms shipments to Israel. We've given them enough so far, but they can do whatever they want with what they've got. Honestly, that's probably enough to bring a lot of people back into the fold. You know, like, I, my, my read is that, like, it, it would be, like, almost a minimal effort for him and his coalition partners to move subtly and probably ultimately meaninglessly in the direction of like the many of like interlocutors for Palestinian rights, life and freedom, and that they would probably reap benefits from that. So like, even as a cynical calculation, the fact that they can't do that and we have to be subject to these moral lectures is, uh, you know, awfully obnoxious at the end of the day to say well the well jacob i mean even if they didn't make that ultimately at this point probably a symbolic gesture that even if it did redound to their success electorally it's the principle that matters because they will have been forced into that position through thuggish intimidation yes that's right yeah so sent to the countryside and deprived of their classes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it says civil rights demonstrators had been shut out of electoral politics by force since Reconstruction. The pro-Palestine, pro, pro, sorry, the pro-Palestinian movement, by contrast, is barely even attempting democratic participation. The movement could have run an anti-Israel candidate against Biden, but never bothered. No doubt, anticipating they would lose. I mean, like I don't know. Look at the polling on like what Democratic voters feel about this issue right now. It doesn't. It seems like there's sort of a mismatch between Jonathan Chape's perception. And the reality here, I'm just going to finish it off here. It says the ethics of the cause come into sharper focus. If you imagine it being done by Biden haters and red <laughs> MAGA hats rather than by Biden haters and Kiefas. Sure, they're idealistic. Plenty of Trump's followers have ideals, too. If your movement's goal is to prevent those who disagree with you from expressing themselves and you delight in meeting out abuse and humiliation to your targets, you're showing the world you cannot be trusted with power. To which I say, I cannot be trusted with power because that's. <laughs> That's a, I, that's exactly, exactly describes my politics. I do not think people who disagree with me should have a right to voice their opinions. This is just such like a a bullshit workaround for someone who spent like the last six years complaining about like identity politics and like wokeism to just like 
dance around the fact that now that it's his turn, he's suddenly very into those things. He's he's now very into the idea of like cordoned off spaces that are like uh, free from any interference or you know feelings of being unsafe. I I don't know what he means by there being like uh, racial epithets, but I assume it's just like Zionist, probably. <laughs> it's like this is the exact same like identity politics shit that he's complained about pretty much his entire career, but he's, he's dressing it up in this, uh, you know, the the end of rational politics. I, I don't see him complaining about racial epithets when people say "orange man" bad. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, uh, does the thought of does the thought of democratic politicians being uh, uh, verbally abused by people angry about their genocidal policy towards Gaza? Does oh, you like that? Well, imagine if it were. Imagine a scenario that's completely different. Still like it? I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, also like Democrats at this point. I mean, at least the presidential candidate is like completely immunized about this sort of thing because one, he doesn't know what's going on like does it matter well joe biden's lower jaw unhinges like alien as he puts a full an entire ice cream cone in his mouth <laughs> is, he, is, he, is he noticing that like on the far outskirts somebody is yelling like free gaza i i just i simply i don't even believe this stuff is as disruptive as as they as shape w- wants you to believe it is like even just like leaving aside all the totalitarian talk or whatever i mean at the end of the day uh, once again like there are always hecklers in the audience so yeah. so regardless of the content this is just like this is part of the uh, raucous robust american democratic tradition going like all, all the way back to the Adamses and the Jeffersons ca- calling each other's like sons of snakes and whores. Yeah, it's and- the oldest. It's the it's the oldest lesson that like everyone should have learned back in grade school. Don't dish it out if you can't take it. And if someone's fucking teasing you, give it back. Do a little crowd work, Jamie Raskin, and be like, "Hey, I don't come down to the place you work and knock the dick out of your mouth." You know, like get some classic zingers like that, <laughs> and you know, like you'll start. You'll it, it, this this threat of a liberal illiberal authoritarianism will lose a little bit of its bite if you can just you know just do some insults, just get, get some get some riffs off. And, and th- you just know that like uh, John Jay is also one of those like one of those American liberal guys who's also like, oh. If a- Prime Minister's questions in England is so great. The 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 the, the, the give and take, the insults, the, the the jeers, and the quick wit. I I love watching it. I wish we had a forum like that in the U.S. But then when you know when he sees the equivalent of it, he recoils and he recoils in horror. That listener is is how you write a fucking column. That that that's how you get paid the big bucks by New York Magazine. Thank you, Jonathan Shade. It's been too long.